Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see you. Uh, excited about the start of a, another school year. It's great to see our student athletes all back on campus as well. You know, four of our sports will be in, in action this coming weekend, so getting everything into full uh, full tilt. And obviously, as, as the coaches that you've had an opportunity to just hear from, we're really excited about the opportunity to play Florida uh, in the swamp. Uh, and also, uh, we're excited about the 4,000, uh, at least 4,000. That's the number of tickets we got. So we'll have those all sold. And I'm sure there will be some other Hurricane fans that uh, will be in the swamp whenever we take on the Gators at 3.30. So uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, look forward to answering your questions. Dan, has there been any conversation about another home and home? I know you still have one more game, obviously, but you, had, you do these so many years in advance. Has there been any conversation before about another home and home? At this point in time, not. Uh, I look forward to seeing Scott this weekend on the trip. And uh, just in my number of years of being an athletic director, sometimes when you're on these uh, trips and you have one of these non-conference games is when you really start saying, hey, this has worked out real well for both sides. So is there some, let's get together in the near future and talk about upcoming opportunities. Dan, did you say that you guys have sold the 4,000 ticket along? Yes. Okay, just want to double check. And then um, with the Football Operations Center, just how has the progress on that been coming along? I think I saw you guys were originally hoping to break ground this uh, last year, but I don't think that's happened yet, I recall. So what's the status of that? We're, we pivoted a little bit. Um, we're moving, you know, the Football Operations Center is still the, the thing that we want to get done long term, uh, but we're moving forward and extending the indoor practice facility, creating a new uh, weight room. Uh, we actually are looking forward to getting that done and having some, some dirt moved and, and some early packages done uh, during this fiscal year of the university. So, uh, you know, the things that are going to help our student athletes get better each and every day, uh, whether it's the weight room or, or expanding the indoor practice facility, I think we're going to try to get those done first. And you know, I always like to ask you, well, when I see is, uh, any uh, update on potential softball program? Uh, no, be, well, let me just tell you, there's been a lot going on in intercollegiate athletics over the last few months. Um, so we've decided to make sure we're really good with where we are uh, programmatically uh, before we take that next step and add an additional program. We, we never want to put ourselves in a circumstance where uh, we're, we're scratching to make the, uh, the thing work. Uh, we wanted to come in and, and do it at a high level. And that's why we're just taking a little pause right now until we see how the entire house settlement comes out and uh, where we can go from there and continue to grow our programs. Yeah, along those lines, you're probably gonna, you've got to find, I think, about $2 million if baseball does go to however many scholarships it's going to go to. I, I'm sure your baseball coaching staff loves it. These changes, how much of a headache can they mean? It's good and it isn't because you've got to find the money from somewhere. What is the unintended consequence, I guess, of all the things that are going on? Well, I just left um, a, a two-hour meeting with our senior staff to talk through exactly how we're moving forward with that. Um, so those, and, and that's not the first one we've had, okay? That was just today's. So I think we're continuing to look at some of those opportunities, what number of scholarships we're going to be looking at long term, because there really is two opportunities. One, what, we're, what our aspirational numbers are for each one of those programs, and where do you get to in the, in the first year that these opportunities are available to you? I don't know that you get to the maximum in the first year. So we need to be able to understand, okay, where do we think we're going to get to, and then how do we help cover those costs, and then get with the university and say, okay, how do we, how do we work together to make that happen? Kind of pivoting back to the Florida matchup, obviously these two programs don't play each other every single year. Why was it so important to get this home and home, uh, home, and home series with those guys? Well, it, first of all, I have to credit my predecessor, Blake James, for pulling that together. Uh, he and Scott worked on that. I don't know the exact date of the contract, but uh, it's, uh, it's, been a, it's been on the books for a while. It is important because, you know, this is inside the state of Florida. These young people know one another from being in high school, competing against one another. Uh, you know, they're a great SEC opponent, opponent and a great historical uh, opponent. So uh, that's why, you know, to, to the first question that Gary asked, you know, we want to be able to move forward, have some con conversations to see if we can put another one on the books here in the not too distant future. It was 19. 19? When they got Okay. For whatever. Well, thank you. I appreciate no, that. No, I'm old. I don't understand. From your standpoint, just acting President Joe Echeverria, just his relationship with the athletic department and uh, his leadership, 
right now from that standpoint? You know, I've been in the business 35 years and, you know, I've worked, you know, either as an athletic director for a number of presidents and, you know, inside athletic departments. Um, Joe is incredibly involved. He's incredibly supportive of our athletic program. Um, he understands the value that our athletic program can bring to the entire enterprise of the University of Miami. Um, as a graduate, I believe in 1978, you know, and then he went into the business world and watched um, from his business view how athletics helped the university grow over all those two decades of the 80s, 90s, and into the early 2000s and sees you know, how we can, again, really help from a brand perspective, being successful, move the uh, institution to new levels. So he's been very supportive. He's a, a great confidant to be able to bounce ideas off of. Um, but he's gotten a lot busier since he's gotten that acting president's title, I will tell you that. Is that kind of almost where, it's a really broad question, so I'm sorry, but is this kind of almost where university presidents are going to go now, or it's going to shift away from an academic to a CEO type since the you numbers know, are just so, they're not like ever before. And not just, not just talking about athletics, everything. It's just not like 20 years ago. It's a great question. And you know, sometimes we have to look to the past to understand the future. Um, for years and years, directors of athletics were former coaches who had retired and moved on to different parts of the athletic department. And we could name a litany of people who were in that role. Um, I think now as institutions of higher learning are becoming more complex, um, that maybe it is for certain situations. I don't know that it's, it's broad-based for everyone, but in certain situations, and maybe those that have medical centers associated with them or other you know, uh, different types of, of subsidiaries, not just the, the regular uh, academy piece, uh, maybe folks with Joe's background um, are, are, are going to be looked at differently. Um, for those kind of roles. I certainly hope so here because, he, as I said, he's fantastic, one of the smartest people I've ever met and, and thoughtful people I've ever met. Um, so uh, from the standpoint of what he wants to do and the university wants to do, time will tell. But uh, the archetype of what a university president is in the 2020s, 2030s, it, it may certainly change. Hey, and from the uh, University of Miami perspective, can you update us on where the thoughts are, the viewpoints are, where things stand in terms of the overall conference situation with the ACC and college football in general? Well, first and foremost, uh, the University of Miami is a proud and happy member of the Atlantic Coast Conference. Okay, and it is something that you know we've we've stated over and over again. I certainly understand where Florida State and Clemson are coming from as it relates to the questions that they have, uh, but the but the conference in general has said, look, we're going to make sure that we protect our entire membership, and they're going to be very vigilant in doing that. Commissioner Phillips um, said that as recently as um, Saturday on on game day when he was in Ireland. Uh, so. All of those things will take care of themselves. You know, we are now in a position where we're competing. Uh, again, we're out of the summer uh, where everybody was kind of looking at different things. We're now getting back into competition. So uh, we look forward to competing with Florida State, competing with Clemson. Uh, they're, you know, they're valuable members of, of the Atlantic Coast Conference. And so we're, we're looking to continue to move forward. As it relates to all of college football, I think, you know, we, uh, college football has taken a a huge turn moving from the four person playoff or 14 playoff to a 12 team playoff and all the idiosyncrasies that go along with that. I mean, we're going to have games, playoff games on college campuses, which I think are going to be incredibly exciting. OK, but that'll be the first time that happens. And anytime you do anything for the first time, you know, you're going to come back after you know, two or three months and say, OK, we could have done this better. But I think that all of college football is is looking at, at the extent, expanded playoff and saying, OK, how are we going to look at this? How are we going to make it better? Knowing that in two years we're going to go from 12 to 14. Um, so it's going to continue to continue to grow. College football, I think, is still incredibly healthy. Uh, from the standpoint of, of popularity, I believe it's only behind the NFL as it relates to you know, overall TV viewership and, and those types of things. So uh, really bullish on where college football is going to move to. Do you see basketball moving off 68? Ooh, that's a great question. You know, I know there's continued to be conversation about it. I know Jim uh, has been a, a proponent 
of expanding the, uh, the tournament. It may, I just don't know what the timing is of how to, how to uh, move forward. You know, they, they have not really had, uh, they've not really expressed a, a timetable to, to look to expand it beyond 68. Something you said, when I asked about the scholarships earlier, I forgot, I, I wanted to follow up with something. Because, like I said, I'm old, I forget something. Uh, me too. <laughs> it happened. There are so many unknowns in your world. What conference are you going to be in five years? Will the ACC exist as it is? Are, is Miami going to pay students to are, are schools going to that model? Like, how the heck do you plan for anything? Because it can all change tomorrow. And, and I know, like, nothing is always, no, there's no absolutes ever. But the wild, the West has never been as wild, wild as it is right now in college athletics. How do you have a two-hour meeting with senior staff and plan stuff when the rug's going to be pulled out from underneath you more often than not? We'll have another two-hour meeting um, because we'll 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 look at at whatever the landscape is. You know, it really we're looking at an enterprise that basically didn't change from the mid 80s. You know, the last sea change was the decision with Georgia and Oklahoma from the Supreme Court to be able to open up television. That was really one of the bigger things. And then in the early 2000s, you know, they they put these academic, you know, new academic restrictions in, the APR, the the graduation success rate, progress towards a degree, and that was a pretty big sea change. But that wasn't, you know, fundamental to how the organization worked. It was really kind of focused on one goal, and that was to get student athletes to graduate. And you know what? They have, and they, you know, they they've come up to that challenge. And right now, you don't talk about that a whole lot because people see incredibly positive graduation rates at at, at schools of higher education. So, I think we've shown that we can adapt um, along the way. But this type of a change, you know, with the settlement, with paying student athletes, um, is going to take just, I think, a little more time to adapt and, and come forward with the rules. We still don't know what all the rules are. Um, we hopefully will know uh, when Judge Wilkins, uh, uh, you know, looks at the settlement, gives her comments, uh, and, and maybe uh, moves forward. Probably the, the timing that I'm hearing is the first quarter of 2025. And then we'll have to put everything together and, and, and move forward. Will the first year be without bumps? <laughs> no. Um, it, it, there'll be a lot of things that we'll learn in, in that first year as, as we move from this model to that model. Um, but as history's told us, we can adjust and we can adapt. You talk about the rising expenses. Uh, has anybody provided any hope that any time in the near future that revenues in the ACC could increase significantly in some way, shape, or form? Well, you guys all know at this point in time, coming into this fiscal year, uh, because of the addition of Cal, Stanford, and SMU, and their varying uh, degrees of, of, of sharing of our media revenue, plus the increased money from the college football playoff, the ACC has created an incentive pool. So schools that are uh, that do well in, in football, whether it be going to the college football playoff, being ranked at the end of the year inside of um, the, the CFP top 25, going to bowl games, and then for basketball, making it into the NCAA tournament and moving forward, you know, all those schools will have an opportunity to participate in this uh, incentive pool, which will help move it forward. Uh, those, that's the biggest change, Gary. I mean, that, that's the biggest change that, that we have going for us right now. I'd ask about basketball tickets. Jim's obviously had great success the last few years. Chris is sort of probably an unknown entity to a lot of your families. Sure. But and we all know the challenge of drawing to women's basketball. Are, are there ways, is there anything innovative that you're thinking about? Are you thinking about free for women's basketball? Like is there, is, I guess, how creative do you have to be to get people in lots go for the women's game? You know, it, it's an interesting question about free. You know, the, a lot of folks tried that um, during my tenure as, as director of athletics and being in athletics, and it never really has worked because people don't value what they don't pay for. So we have to we have to have a great product, which I think you know, obviously in the men's game and the women's game over the last few years we've seen that, and we've seen increases in the number of people that have been inside the Watsco Center. The challenge now is to make sure that we continue doing that moving forward, continue to have a really um, high level of basketball, both in the men and women's game. And I, and I believe Tricia, uh, because she's the new uh, person here, uh, she did a great job in uh, Toledo 
uh, where she was uh, prior to coming to Miami in growing her fan base. And I think she's, she's utilizing some of those techniques uh, here in the Coral Gable, South Miami, you know, the, 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 the real close area where people can just jump in their car and come over to the Watsco and, and watch a game. So, uh, you know, our marketing department is helping. We're you're doing a lot of things from a social perspective. Uh, but, you know, one of the other big pieces is our students on campus. Uh, students on campus in a basketball arena, you've all seen it. You know, when we've had great student attendance, you know, that place just takes on an entirely different uh, atmosphere. So we want to make sure our students through, you know, our affiliation with um, uh, our, our, our Category 5 uh, marketing arm for the students, and we, we continue to work with them to come to basketball games and football and all the other games that we have. So uh, they've been a very important part of where we go forward. Some of the mid-majors have, in the Northeast, have based, I don't know if it's, I don't know if they throw them in or not, but if you buy a men's basketball season ticket, you get a women's basketball season ticket. Hockey East did that, and that's hockey when women's hockey was, was first coming in. Is that something that Miami would ever think about? Some, something along those lines? Like, I think that may, I think they may have had that here in the past. Um, I don't know whether, you know, I, we haven't continued it, but it's certainly something that we can look at into the future.